The Unshackled Waves, Episode 63. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, and it's time for another interview show. Our guest for today is uh, David McManus, who is a contributor at uh, Being Libertarian, the website, uh, and he's also, uh, what would you call it, a uh, professional ship poster in the Ankapistan Facebook group, which we'll be discussing uh, quite a bit. He's, a, he's only 17 years old. He's a high school student from Adelaide. I've met David at the Friedman Conference. Now, for those of you watching on video, don't let his hair fool you. Uh, David is very much in our camp, uh, but it was his hair that was the, the reason that I didn't talk to him at the, the Friedman Conference. But we might talk a bit about that soon. But I've, So I thought I'd invite him on the show today so I can, uh, and you can get to know him properly, so I can discuss both uh, libertarian and online culture. So David, Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And it's great to be with working with the Unshackled. Yep. Oh, I'm certainly grateful to, to have you on. And yes, uh, apologies for, for not talking to you at the, at the Friedman Conference. No, all good. Uh, I met so many different people there. So it's great to have this residual, you know, effect of being able to continually meet great people throughout time. So yeah. It was because of, uh, I'm not sure if you were there on the Friday when I had my debate against the left libertarians, that was pretty much, uh, I'd had my dealings with left libertarians on, on the Friday and so when, when I saw, saw your hair I was just like, oh, I don't even want to engage. Most definitely. The hair is, the hair is always a dead giveaway. Uh, there's, there's the comparison online between uh, the venomous toads that come in different colours, and the colours of you know dyed hair, it's it's uh, it's something. Yeah, oh, I've I've noticed you've you've uh, groomed yourself uh, a bit lately. So, uh, perhaps other people have said the same thing. Yeah, but, but, but enough hair hair discussion. So, um, yeah, let's begin by uh, talking a bit about you. So, how would you describe your political philosophy? And uh, as I said, you're only seventeen. So, how's that developed uh, over your uh, teenage years? Sure. Uh, so, right now, I would be after a lot of reading and investigating what I would call a uh, Hoppian anarcho-capitalist. So, uh, that's working off cases of uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, Murray Rothbard, to some extent people like Hayek and Sowell, but uh, probably not to the same degree as Hopper. So that's a uh, complete privatization of, of everything, the abolishment of the state, uh, implementation of sort of private social covenants and contracts, uh, a purely voluntary society as it were. But of course, uh, you know, from my generation, we, we haven't really experienced the horrors of communism, particularly in Australia. So, uh, you know, when I was incredibly young, I, I was a staunch communist who thought, you know, oh, let's, let's just all be rich and that will work. Uh, from there, there was a lot of just casual centrism and apathy because, you know, uh, big words like economics tended to, uh, to me a bit. And then it was the edge lord, you know, the, the Che Guevara shirts and the, the really, you know, uh, provocative stuff that is not really all that provocative whatsoever. And from there it was, you know, soft libertarianism and then eventually anarchism. Uh, and are you down with the, the more, or uh, 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 would you say, radical aspects of Hoppianism? We've, we've talked a bit about Hans Hermann Hopper on previous podcasts with other libertarians. Are you down with uh, physical removal of undesirables? And what about throwing communists out of helicopters? Um, I, I, I like it in the meme sense, but I think that uh, in terms of, you know, pragmatism, I... When you say physical removal, you know, if you have someone with a sh within a shopping centre and they are misbehaving and throwing things around, you know, recklessly, 
of course the mall the mall cop has the right to escort them out of the property which is you know how i'd view, how i'd view things so in that sense i do very much approve of physical removal specifically for communists yeah and it's it's when a lot of people they as you said soft libertarian and sort of hopper is sort of seen as the the hard libertarian um yeah i when people say soft libertarian and talking about people that uh, are sort of like Gary Johnson, where it's just the bureaucracy of the Democratic Party, but then there's that whole element of, oh yeah, well you know, kind of like marijuana, so there's that too. But there's not that's not libertarianism. That's not in any way libertarian thought. Saying, well, I don't like taxes, and occasionally I like to smoke a little bit of ganja. That doesn't make for you know all of the great right wing economists throughout time. It's it's not it's comparable to just anything to come out of academia. So you're more for you know taking a, a principled stand and being you know open about this is this is what I what I stand for, not sort of you know pandering to or maybe that's considered too extreme. Just laying it all out there. This is the philosophy. Well. I do believe in gradualism, so moving moving slowly from things, because people that, uh, a lot of ANCAPs and libertarians that believe that they will simply achieve their society uh, at a click of their fingers, that they're, they're not being utilitarian, they're not being pragmatic, and they're completely negating the process, just think, thinking that, you know, things will transform overnight. Clearly that's not true, and clearly you need to take steps to uh, sort of subvert that. I mean, if you look at Ron Paul and Rand Paul, they are cl working closely with the Republican Party as opposed to the Libertarian Party because the Republican Party is for small government and the Libertarian Party, although supposed to be for small government, has not proven that to the same extent that the Republican Party has. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, there, there's def so you think there's a difference between the Gary Johnson approach and the Ron Paul approach? Oh, most definitely. Gary Johnson is in no way a uh, a, a libertarian at all. Uh, you know, he's he's often called online Gary Bake That Cake Johnson because because of the opinion that he took on that matter. Uh, Ron Paul, privatization, uh, less tax, complete you know, uh, legalization or decriminalization of you know firearms and narcotics. Uh, and you know he's even been on court. He's even been caught on tape saying things like taxation is theft. Whereas uh, you know Gary Johnson, he's in no way representative of that kind of thing. And if the most libertarian people within American politics uh, at the moment, and in fact you know throughout history, have always sided the Republican Party, then I think that is incredibly self-evident. Yeah, well, there's definitely a lot along with the, the U.S. Libertarian Party. Now, uh, obviously, you're only uh, 17. You've got your, your whole life ahead of you, but you're already a contributor to what I'd say is a major libertarian website, and you're deeply ingrained in online libertarian culture. So what are your goals in life? Uh, your bio says that you like to be involved in politics. You also like writing. So where, where do you see your life heading at this stage? Um, I actually applied for what I would consider to be my dream job, which was a, uh, a as media advisor for the Liberal Democrats here in Australia. And uh, I, I I can't stress enough how much it would mean to get that job. Not only because I'd be able to support myself, but because I'd be doing so whilst also being you know principled and standing up for what I believe in, which I think is important in a young generation, regardless of how uh, warped and inconsistent their beliefs actually are. Um, so, if I, w if I were to be chosen as a media advisor, I can first of all guarantee that I would do a considerably better job than Sean Spicer, and two, that I would have my heart and soul in it. Um, if, if I can't attain something like that, then I would very much just like to make my voice heard one way or another. I can continue with being libertarian, which might I add, I don't get paid for, it's just, uh, it's just a way for me to express myself to as many people as I can and to sway you know a few people that might be on that more Gary Johnson side of uh, libertarian thought so really I'm not asked how much money I make or what 
exact position I am upholding, but so long as I'm upholding those principles and managing to spread my message just out there. I uh, yeah if yeah if you uh, want to like a career or a career in politics or are obsessed with politics, it's definitely not for the money. It's definitely because you know you want to see your beliefs and ideas uh, prevail, especially if you want to be uh, a principled uh, pl a political operator. I mean, if you want to obviously rise up the ranks and climb the greasy poles of the major parties, you can do that, but then you'll just be spewing the prime ministers or opposition leaders talking points every day, uh, every minute. Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, I have immense respect for a figure like David Lionhelm that, you know, even after being elected to the position that he's in, you know, still campaigns and, and, and votes for uh, less pay as a politician. It, it's his own self-interest, but it's what he sees to be, you know, uh, communally uh, correct and, and beneficial for society. So I think that that says a lot about his character and uh, as well as that the nature of the party. Yeah, I'm a Liberal Democrats member myself. I've been in the, the party seven years and yeah, it's definitely, I like being part of a party where we're able to, you know, say what we believe, you know, propose, you know, what we think is the best where, where you know, we, we're not bound by, you know, any other group of senior people trying to control us. We don't have to say a whole bunch of stuff that we, we don't believe in. That's just, and I know that there's a lot of people who say that you have to be in government to affect change, but you also need uh, parties like the Liberal Democrats and politicians like David Lineham who, uh, who are always there saying, you know, this is what actually needs to happen and are not controlled by anyone. Yes, yeah, most definitely. Uh, people that say, you know, you can't make change unless you're in um, unless you're in government. I think that's completely ridiculous. I mean, even if you're looking at uh, the socialists that campaign out in the streets, you know, socialist alternative, whatever they are, they're making a difference in one way or another, mostly through you know swaying people to the right. But they are making a difference one way or the other, and I think that is inherently, you know, uh, contradictory to the belief, commonly held belief, in fact that, you know, government brings power because, of course, politicians are simply just people at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, that's, that's definitely true. I've, I've noticed that, you've ha that you have quite a large socialist problem in, in Adelaide as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's probably true what they say that Adelaide is just a mini Melbourne because, yeah, we have our problem with the socialists as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm well aware of it. Melbourne is renowned for its uh, hellhole nature. No offence. I'm sure, I'm sure that Melbourne is, is, is lovely in many respects. In fact, I've been there, but, you know, just some of the people, definitely. Yeah, uh, don't worry. I'm, I'm aware of Melbourne's flaws, but I'll, st I'll, st I'll still never leave, I don't think. Yeah. Now, um, as I said, when I first uh, saw you, I thought you were a left libertarian, but I'm eager to get your uh, thoughts on left libertarians, uh, because you know, I've pretty much at my wit's end with left libertarians, because I, I always say that they have a warped view of society, where they think that they mainly live in the inner city where they think that everyone there and plus in the media thinks like them. And so that's how they try to sell the, the libertarian message to just people who are in that inner city bubble. And they seem to ignore the, the masses, the people living out in the, the, the suburbs. And they also have a real dislike of the, the ordinary person as well. They say that they're, you know, ignorant and don't know what's good for them, almost, or, well, or almost like a genuine leftist. But what's your view on left libertarians? Uh, well, I mean, there was my experience that you may have read about, which was uh, on the steps of Government House, there was a socialist alternative meetup with a whole bunch of students and peers my age, as well as people, you know, further on in university, campaigning for free education and free health care and previous to do that. Uh, but I, I decided to approach them as they were making quite a, you know, loud, raucous and 
uh, I approached the little printed out sign that just said taxation is theft. And uh, someone that someone came up to me with a shaved, shaved pink hair with a little little mullet on the end. And uh, she looked like if Sinead O'Connor had been sort of hit by a car and had had little shrapnel all over her face, lots of piercings. Uh, and she proceeded to call me, uh, you know, a fascist, a racist, um, every name under the book. And uh, I, I told her that I, I you know, I, I was sorry. Uh, and she asked me, you know, why I held these beliefs. And uh, I started trying to explain to her. And she walked off. And uh, a little bit later on, of course, the protest had had moved moved uh, moved further on. And I hear this shrill shriek, and I got tackled to the ground by a corpulent, lardy uh, socialist blob that had decided to take its wrath out upon me. And so if that doesn't say it all about left libertarians, I don't know what does the fact that, you know, uh, they're simply having three words printed out on a, on, a, on a sheet of paper which aren't offensive, that don't target any personal group of people, that is enough to, you know, justify violence. On top of that, there's. I don't believe that the authoritarian libertarian line in the political compass is accurate. I believe that the authoritarian and libertarian line is is you know across across the the center uh, to, to divide you know authoritarian on the left and libertarian on the right. Uh, I don't believe that people are libertarian if their money is still being, you know, centrally owned or controlled or, you know, their their sense of trade doesn't come from a place of voluntary interaction. And I think that left, left libertarians are deluded enough to think, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll legalise, you know, pot and drugs and all this sort of stuff, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll wait in a bread line. I, I, it boggles my mind to think that someone can wait in a bread line think, oh, this is all right, you know, I'm sure that the state will provide me with my methamphetamine eventually. That sort of thing won't happen. Uh, I, I don't understand that. Revolutionary Catalonia, it, 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 it failed abysmally. I don't know why ANCOMs, you know, you fun about it so much because there's no basis to, you know, suggest why it would have succeeded in any way, shape or form. I could run forever, but the point is physical removal now. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, yeah, I've learned over the years that with the, the left, you, you just can't reason with them. And a lot with trying to pitch libertarianism to the left, they like, you know, you get them on the, like, key issues that they like, sex and drugs. Well, the left actually don't like sex anymore, so, or maybe, maybe just drugs. But as soon as, like, you talk to them about the free market, they're like, oh, you know, you support, you know, the corporate evil oppressors and, like, that's, you know, wicked and evil, and then that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, they, 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 you know, they often say, oh, well, you know, what you're promoting is, is like 1984, where, where everything's, uh, you know, all these social covenants, people can implement whatever laws they want. Uh, we need, we need democracy and we need democracy now. Yeah, well, you know, if democracy is of the people, for the people, by the people, then the Jewish people that elected Hitler about to power committed, you know, suicide. I don't believe that democracy is representative of the individual so much as it is of the collective, which often negates the individual. Uh, it, their, their sense of their sense of authority is based purely on whether or not there is some form of hierarchy. And of course, even with anarcho-capitalists such as myself, sure we have a hierarchy, but we acknowledge that hierarchies can exist within anarchism. And the thing is, even for, say, anarcho-communism, the same thing would be true. Uh, try asking an anarcho-communist whether or not uh, a six-month-old infant should hold the same power as a father within a household. Try asking uh, sadism and masochism. Uh, that a dominant and submissive relationship should be allowed within a bedroom. Now, they will approve of these two hierarchies based on the fact that they are voluntary 
but at the same time, if you uh, submit a job application form, you are doing so to an oppressive tyrant who will give you money and uh, take your work and exploit all this sort of bollocks. Uh, I've, uh, it always confuses me, the anarcho-communism, so you're for no rules, but collectivism, so how are you going to deal with uh, the people who say, I don't want to go along with this? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, Even when we're looking at, you know, revolutionary Catalonia, they routinely murdered clerics and, you know, religious people based on the fact that Marx was, you know, vehemently against religion and all this sort of stuff, which they justified by saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, religious people are violent. Uh, look at the Crusades, look at yada, 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 which they're still doing to this point in time. Even the fact that, you know, if, if you go back and look at, say, the Crusades, it was a, uh, uh, you know, protectionary measure, but I, I won't digress too much there. The point is uh, they don't have any form of moral consistency in the sense that, you know, we will abolish the state but implement something exactly like the state. Uh, I, I don't understand it. I remember I interviewed a while back uh, YouTuber Love Life and Anarchy and like he's got a, a ton of these videos debating anarcho-communists and just uh, destroying them. I recommend people go ahead and check those. Now, uh, there's also, obviously, there, there's been a oh, sort of mini uh, civil war in the libertarian movement uh, of late by the reason why I talk about the left libertarians a lot is because they're, they're always they're, they're always trying to alter libertarian history and at the moment they're trying to remove uh, Murray Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hoppe from libertarianism. I mean Jeffrey Tucker for example cl uh, claimed that is claiming that Rothbard uh, became senile when he joined the the paleo -liber uh, libertarian movement which Tucker at the time was also a member of. Uh, he seems to alter his own history and there was also Stephen Horowitz uh, saying that he preferred uh, Marx to Hoppe. Uh, had, uh, is, had, does this concern you quite a bit that there's this effort to sort of try and twist the the libertarian movement? Um, yeah, most definitely. I mean, I think that when I first started to notice this trend, you know, after you'd read about all of the, the great libertarians like, you know, Murray Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hopper, and then you sort of delve into them a bit more and you'd, you'd sort of hear these counterpoints. And the two ones I heard were that Mirafa was a racist, and they sort of evidenced this by a couple of his sort of early ramblings that were uh, in some way disparaging to African American communities. But it wasn't even so much that, it was much more the fact that he associated himself with people who had in the past made these sorts of comments. So it was this whole guilt by association thing. And uh, I, I look, then looked at the, the critiques of Hans Hermann Hopper. And they were that you know he was a uh, he was a mass homophobe and all this sort of stuff, which I he was talking about. He wasn't discussing the fact so much that he should uh, obliterate homosexuality or any of this sort of not nonsense. He was saying that within a personal social covenant, you know, he he would not permit this for the progress of society. But the whole point of these you know covenants is the fact that. If a person enters your house, they abide by the rules of your house. You can set your own rules based on the property that you own. Uh, he wasn't, as an anarchist, talking about universally banning homosexuality or whatever through the enforcement of the state. And these, these critiques of Rothbard and Hopper to sort of defame them are pot shots at character based on poorly constructed straw men. And I guess my only real retort to them is that I would advise these people to go and look at, you know, other philosophers. Uh, Karl Marx, for example, uh, raped his, uh, he, he raped his maid and beat her and kicked her out to the curb with his kid. And uh, look, there's a lot of the figures that the left is despised to, you know, the same cases could be made. They are, in fact, flawed individuals. And I think that's evident across the board that many of these, you know, great philosophers across time were in some way mentally deranged. I mean, people still worship Nietzsche as if he were a god. Uh, irony there. But, you know, this man flayed donkeys in public, public and, you know, 
drew things on the wall with his own feces. People are... <laughs> Many of these figures are deranged. I think that pointing to, you know, guilt by association or personal preference in your home are some of the worst arguments to, me to be made in that field of argumentation, which in itself is flawed. Uh, yeah, that's that's really all I have to say based on that. It's they're writing they're writing off these characters, you know, Rothbard and Hopper, based on things that a should not matter and b are mostly false. Uh, and they seem to forget these people that you know Rothbard and Hopper. They've done more for uh, the growth of libertarianism, the spread of uh, of the ideas of liberty, more than. They, they could ever hope for. So I don't get why these people say, oh, we know how to spread liberty now, but are oh, these people who, you know, most libertarians know about or are inspired by, of, oh, oh, you know, we'll, we'll just throw them in the garbage. And I've also noticed the same trend with, you know, even Ron Paul. I mean, his presidential campaigns was 2008, 2012, not that long ago. There's even efforts now to delete him from history, say that, oh, you know, Ron Paul is a, uh, a Christian uh, fundamentalist, or oh, he's a Russophile, and uh, really, you know, trying to say that his contribution wasn't all that great. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was watching uh, a video not that long ago by The Amazing Atheist, uh, don't ever make that mistake. I mean, I'm an atheist myself, but even I admit that that dude is awful. Uh, and he did a deconstruction of Ron Paul because this was this a, a, a long time ago. But his he was saying that Ron Paul was you know not a libertarian because he was anti-abortion, and his evidence of this was the fact that Ron Paul opted to let the states have their own autonomy over the laws regarding abortion rather than having it all, all centralised and, you know, under, under a federal level. Now, of course, I, as many other people have noted, this makes it a lot easier to, you know, you know have this sort of thing transpire in, in, in state to state, you know, territory. And then as soon as that happens, you know, the precedent is set for, for you know, further states in the US. And, you know, this, this same thing can be noted in marijuana legalisation. But the point is that, you know, he was simply, you know, written off despite the fact that it was it was a faulty, you know, claim that was made against him that he was anti-abortion. Now, anarcho-capitalism, it's, it's the, the dream of you. I consider myself a paleo-libertarian. I also support... I'm sympathetic to anarcho-capitalism, but I'm always of the opinion, let's just see how much of the, the state we can reduce before we consider abolishing the state completely. But can anarcho-capitalism ever be achieved, or is it just, you know, a pipe dream? Uh, there's an article on Mises.org which evaluates uh, medieval Iceland, and medieval Iceland uh, had what essentially amounts to an anarcho-capitalist society, uh, complete voluntarism across the board, uh, and that system of functioning lasted much longer than uh, the United States up until this point today. So I think that if we were to look at the posterior knowledge, we can evaluate, at least historically, uh, the validity of anarcho-capitalism or a similar voluntary society. But I do think that for the time being, well, that's you know, when, when I was just addressing that, the, what you were supposed to draw away, or what the, the you know the listener to this is supposed to draw away. Sorry about that. Is that. Uh, this kind of society has worked before and there is a set precedent for it to be implemented again at least to try whether or not that can you know whether or not that is in any way for modern day society is is for someone else to you know uh analyze but even through the rationalist system it's been laid out across the board in so many different books i mean if you just look at say the ethics of liberty Democracy, the God that failed. Basic economics by Thomas Sowell. Uh, that's it's 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 all right there in rationalism, but also in uh, empiricism, as I've displayed before. So it's valid across the board, but 
how do we achieve how do we achieve an anarcho-capitalist society? Well, that's very simple, uh, gradualism. So when I was, you know, thinking over the 2016 election, I eventually sided with Donald Trump. Do I like Donald Trump? Sort of. Uh, do I like his policies? Definitely not. So why would I, as an anarchist, be for Donald Trump? Well, he's outlandish, he's bombastic, he says very effective things to, or not, he says mildly disgruntling things to, you know, agitate the left. And this kind of thing does wonders because the people that, you know, sat complacently through eight years of Barack Obama are suddenly starting to question the government and starting to question the process that puts their leader in charge. So if if it takes Donald Trump to wake these people up and say, hey, you know what, perhaps our government system is flawed if a person like Donald Trump can get into power. Hey, yeah, he's bombing babies and I actually notice it for the first time. I wonder if Obama did the same thing. That kind of thought, if it springs from Donald Trump, you know, pretending that he's a retarded person on stage, at least it's starting to happen. And it wouldn't happen with a person like Hillary Clinton, who is so, you know, knees deep in funding that everything she says has been, you know, passed through a dozen different testing programs before it gets read out on stage. Uh, a person like Bernie Sanders, who, you know, gets up on stage and lets other people take over his microphone because he's so much of a cuckold that, uh, you know, anyone can simply steal his spotlight. The only change that can be brought about is through the most outlandish figures in politics. Uh, if we go for the bland, complacent alternative, we will only find ourselves stuck in this situation for much further to come. Um, yeah, so the, the only way that you can achieve change is through picking the options that provide it. And that's, I know that that's very simple advice, but for anarchists, uh, left libertarians, right libertarians, uh, Stalinist tankies, if you want to achieve change, uh, don't keep picking the same thing. Yeah, I, I mean, the reason why a lot of libertarians sided with Trump is because they saw him as the, the great disruptor. I mean, look at the, the enemies that he made, look how scared the, the deep state apparatus is with him. I mean, it's his presidency, in my view, is really... Uh, re really exposed just how deep the vested interest inside the United States government is, and a lot of people are waking up to it uh, in the first time, which is a good thing in in my view. Yeah, uh, I wrote a column only a couple of days ago, and I analysed uh, how much money, well, how much corruption there is between the Chinese Communist Party and the Australian government. And just the fact that all of that is not only not discussed, but simply swept under the rug in comparison to Russia. Uh, first of all, the Russia-US ties are tentative at best, but get talked about constantly and get media attention constantly. And uh, Vladimir Putin is getting more celebrity interviews than Brad Pitt these days. And that kind of superstardom, you know, if it's getting... With to Alex Jones' conspiracy, yeah, done with the government. I can support that, even if it's blatantly wrong. I, I definitely think that, uh, although I think anarcho-capitalism is probably not achievable in our lifetime, I think the closest we'll get to it is I'm a big proponent of secession, so if, if ever there's uh, a state or a region wanting to secede from uh, a nation I'm all for it so when California said they wanted to secede when Donald Trump was elected I was like fine go for it When Scotland wanted to become independent I was like fine go for it because that means that the decisions are always are going to be made closer to the people which is closer that you get to voluntarism because people get to make more choices as an individual their, their vote counts for more and I think that's that's better to have or I'd like to have ultimately uh, six billion uh, states ra uh, rather than two hundred. Oh uh, yeah, most definitely. And the same, this uh, similar sort of things been happening with Brexit. You know, 
that the people in the UK have said, oh, okay, well, Ahmad, we are tired of you stabbing people constantly. Uh, we're going to turn to Germany and we're going to ask Germany, can you please stop that? We're going to leave, we're going to draw ourselves out and we're going to select policy that we agree with rather than what the, uh, you know, mass government body agrees with. And what boggled my mind was the fact that, you know, members of the left that consider themselves libertarians or anarchists were, you know, celebrating the uh, European Union, this autonomous government that, you know, sort of spend over... I, I don't understand why anarchists or libertarians would support such an organisation. But these are the same people that support, you know, uh, welfare extensions. Oh, yeah, let's smash the state. But uh, yes, please give us that welfare state, daddy government. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm di digressing too much. But yeah, the point is we need to draw away from the European Union. Uh, oh, no, well, the, the UK needs to draw away from the European Union. The US needs to segment itself a little bit more. Don't let Puerto Rico in, in, into becoming a U.S. state. Uh, let California secede. Let pe people have more autonomy over their states. Uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned the, uh, the t take the, the welfare, the star the beast uh, f uh, position. I, f I find that hilarious that you're destroying the state by uh, t taking other people's money. Yeah. Um... Possession is theft, but give us more possessions. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't understand it. Now let's move to uh, talking about your online activities. Now you're a contributor for Being Libertarian, which uh, yes is is not just a Facebook page. Facebook page has over uh, five hundred thousand uh, followers, if I'm correct. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, and so we're, we're seeing quite a growth in, well, there's a lot of talk about alt media, which uh, the Unshackled is, but there's also a lot of alt libertarian media. Uh, so there's there's not just being libertarian, there's also uh, Liberty Hangout, which is a, a like, uh, another like-minded face, Facebook uh, page slash uh, website. And uh, people are turning away from uh, what I call the establishment libertarian uh, media, such as obviously the Cato Institute or reason.com uh, why, why do you think this uh, trend of uh, alt media has uh, come into the libertarian movement as well uh, I know that because I saw the site analytics not that long ago and being libertarian now gets approximately 2.5 million readers a month uh, or, or you know approx like around about and that stunned me like that that left me completely agog and we have, we have been featured on, you know, CNN and all this sort of stuff. But it's, it's, it's very similar to what's been happening right now with uh, YouTube, where a lot of the different small YouTubers have had their monetary substance, uh, monetary fund taken away from them by YouTube. And this was all kicked off by a campaign by old media because the growth of new media had overtaken them. Uh, and this is, this is basic praxeology, basic behavioral economics, that market competition will break down monopolies. And so when monopolies start to form, say CNN, Fox News, the Cato Institute, uh, Reason.com, and they get cocky and they start to expand, you know, past their mark, uh, you know, when CNN starts to pull uh, Russia stuff out of its ass when Reason.com starts to sway a little bit towards uh, the left a bit too much. When all this stuff sorts starts to happen, and the monopolies get cocky and they don't function as they should, market competition sweeps in and takes their place. It's basic economics. Uh, I didn't include, even though I would consider itself an alt media website. I do consider the Libertarian Republic to be establishment of uh, libertarian media. I mean, even though it has all these clickback titles, it plays it very safe uh, in terms of, liberta of libertarian positions and you know, it doesn't aim to rock the boat except 
They, they, they have mastered the art of uh, advertising and pop-ups. Yep, definitely. Um, I mean, on the on the Being Libertarian squad now, we've got people like Eric Goliath. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he's a great anarcho-capitalist rapper. He's got this massive fan base, and it's really it's really so he he brings so much to the table, and he's on top of his positions being well thought out. He's actually a genuinely good musician. So, yeah, I just um, <clears throat> these new new names are forming, and these old figures, you know, Bill O'Reilly, have been forced out in one way or another. When something dies, something will eventually just take its place. Um, that's, that's what's happening with the media. Yeah, I definitely think that the reason why there there has been this new growth of libertarian websites is because you know libertarians are not followers. I mean, they don't want to be you know to uh, told what's the news by you know a major organisation or corporation of more than more than most people. And so you know they have with the the age of the internet and there's. You no, know, I have thanks to Mises.org. There's all the literature out there, and it's like, no, I'm not going to be told by you know Reason or Cato, you know, what the libertarian position is. I'm going to put my own stuff out there. Yeah, I mean, uh, on top of that, there's the fact that people <clears throat> people like to uh, cluster data and pick what suits their arguments and what suits their position. So when you've got uh, a place like beingcaring.com where we've got a whole lot of different, mm, <coughs> pardon me, when we've got a whole lot of different variety of articles, I mean you do have your left libertarians and your centrists posting articles and stuff there, which is, you know, bizarre. But when you've got such a wide perspective and wide theory of thought, uh, people can sort of say, hey, I'm going to read this article, it differs from what I believe in. But you might find that on, say, Fox News or CNN, where everything is uh, backed by, you know, corporate funding and as such needs to suit an agenda. Uh, when things are financially backed to a certain extent, <clears throat> that sense of autonomy breaks away and they become a hive mind. But people are, are seeking new information, new data, new perspective, and wish to expand their mind they, they look for alternative sources. Uh, I mean, if, if you look at, say, Alex Jones, Alex Jones is getting mass coverage now, uh, and he's getting interviewed by the biggest name at CNN. Alex Jones is off the rails. I mean, he's, he's been caught denying, you know, mass tragedies and mass shootings. They're turning the friggin' frogs gay. But all of this is okay because it's different. Uh, yeah, I, just, people don't like bureaucracy. People don't like what keep, people don't like the political sphere that we are caught in, and they don't like the media that comes along with it. People want change, and that is what breeds extremism. That is what has brought about this new alt right uprising and just this surge of uh, right wing nationalism in general. Uh, yeah. Well, the reason why uh, I like being in alternative media is, and I think a lot of uh, other people who've set up uh, sites themselves like it is because they get to send the agenda. There's no gatekeepers. Like it's you, you know, you don't write a write an article and send it to some, you know, editors of some major uh, new a newspaper and get get the stamp of approval. You can decide, you know, what you want to talk about, put it out there, and let the the people uh, directly decide. I, you know what they think about it. Well, yeah, most most definitely. Um, even my, my youngest articles, my ones I, I put out there into the world when I had very little experience with writing whatsoever, they're absolutely riddled with errors. Even some of my most recent ones, because they don't go through that filtration process. And that's the, the same thing with my thoughts and opinions on this. I have an article called uh, "Helicopters and Leftists" or something to that effect, and you know that that managed to slip by in a relatively mainstream, uh, you know, media platform, or you know, mainstream for for libertarian platform in general. But just the fact that 
it's it's so it's so out there and outlandish and it's changed people don't like having the agenda set as you were saying people like uh artistic endeavors and just general autonomy that's why people on youtube uh they, they one of the guys from a smosh left smosh because he, it was all corporate backed and he didn't have any choosing over what he did. It's the same thing with uh, media and coverage, uh, journalism. So I, I really just think that people want the truth and people won't get the truth if it's so clouded by you know, uh, corporatism. And I know that I'm sounding like a goddamn commie here, so feel free to uh, shut me off at any time. Okay, so <laughs> let's now talk about the the Ankapistan Facebook group, which you've written about, and I'm a member of as well. You you, you post sometimes uh, four or five times a, a day. Now, it's called Ankapistan because that is, for, for those who aren't familiar, it's the fictional anarcho-capitalist nation, even though it's it's supposed to be based on voluntarism. For some reason, that's still uh, a country, but it's basically now just become a group for, for shitposting. Uh, and it, it, a lot of its posts, they mock the, the libertarian non-aggression principle. There's a lot of posts there that uh, uh, argue that pedophilia, incest, bestiality, uh, all types of fetishes uh, are fine. It also posts links to other degenerate things that are going on in us, oh, is this okay? In Ankapistan, it's it's basically yeah, it, 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 it basically there there is no filter on it. It's just people people posting just whatever grotesque stuff they want. Uh, why why are you a member of it, and do you think that there is some point to it all? Um, do I think that there are some points to Ankapistan? Of course, there is. Hearts and minds will win the war. Uh, that's like the Facebook page, uh, I think it's called Sassy, Sassy Socialist Memes or something to that effect. <clears throat> they post horrible memes because, of course, the left can't meme. But uh, people tag onto them, people like them, just because it's it's something to, uh, to glare at, really. And so when people see memes that support their, their opinions and their perspectives, regardless of how bad they are, they'll, they'll cling onto them. So, and Kapistan was set up to have, you know, hyperbolic, uh, a, a blade of grass fell onto my lawn because my ne next door neighbor was cutting his, cutting his grass and uh, I shot him with a machine gun, is this okay? It's set up to mock our political ideology, uh, well, my political ideology, but that's, in many ways that's a good thing uh, because that hive mind is mostly left libertarians now. It's it's mostly left in general. But uh, this this right infiltration. If a person posts, you know, a little anime picture of Hitler or something, you'll see a whole bunch of people lose it. And so it's just it's 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 warfare set up, and it's engaging people in politics that you know would would not be interested in any other generation. It makes politics much more accessible and it makes things much more succinct. I mean, you could have a working understanding of pretty much any philosophy, just put in their name and then put meme after it. Yeah, uh, so, so you do believe that there's a method in all the, the madness, that it's, it's challenging the anarcho-capitalist uh, viewpoint and making the, the people in that group think think a bit more about some of the problems that that would be faced in a narco capitalist society and to think through some of the more finer details of the philosophy. Oh, uh, I mean, not really. I don't believe that uh, you will get a, a great understanding of uh, realism from from memes, but I think that. Uh, even that really outlandish, wild stuff captures people's attention. And even if it gives them the most basic, rudimentary understanding of politics, that is enough because uh, regardless of how flared up people are getting about, you know, Democrats and Republicans, uh, you know, what about that massive underlying spectrum of thought? What about, uh, you know, 
all of the different authoritarian perspectives as well. I mean, Pinnish has, has emerged once again. I mean, just simply send them a picture of a helicopter and they will just lose it. Uh, and this, this historical basis, this political basis, this economic basis, all these things come together and uh, can just be used offhandedly as a joke in conversation. And so that, uh, for a wealth of you know, human experience to simply be used as common vernacular to mock someone on the internet, I think that's pretty great. Uh, and uh, you didn't address uh, what about what's the point of all these you know posts you know talking about sexual degeneracy? Oh well, once again, it's it's just it's just shock humor. It just captures people's attention. Uh, if if a person scrolls through their Facebook feed, they're not going to be caught. That their eye won't be caught by a picture of a cute pug anymore because there's so many of those. It will be caught by the picture of the transsexual person twerking on a picture of Vladimir Putin's being shot into space. That will grab a person's eye, not the pug. Uh, so if you want to make a scene as the, as the communists do in public, as the socialist alternative do in public, if you want to make that same level of difference in people's lives, don't bombard them on the on, on the street. Just some outlandish thing on, uh, and even in the end, Capitan, where people already engage with you know politics, to have that sort of banter back and forth does make conversations grow and evolve uh, to you know elaborate and explore ideas more. So I, I think it's. I think that it's a tool, but it's not the the end uh, the end all of uh, discussion. Now let's finish off uh, talking uh, about Australia because Speaking Libertarian is an international website, and some of your articles have touched on uh, the poor state of liberty in Australia. Um, obviously, our gun laws are really bad. Um, well, I'd say our uh, regards to our drug laws, I mean, they're pretty much bad uh, all, all, all around the, the, the globe, but also we have the, the nanny state as well, the, the welfare state. Uh, do, do you see Australia heading in a libertarian direction anytime soon? Okay, well, we can analyse... I'll, I'll go into a whole bunch of things here, just because it's the final question. Uh, with gun laws, we ha are going to have another gun amnesty. We had our first one after the Port Arthur massacre. So, of course, I believe 44 people died in that. I might be mistaken. Uh, our, our, gun, our, our shooting statistics were on a decline in general. And the Port Arthur massacre acted as somewhat of an anomaly at the time but it was just enough of a trigger to persuade people into reactionary thinking of, hey, this happened once, therefore guns are bad, we should ban them across the board. And after guns were banned, not only did shootings continue, but it still went on that same decline that it was before. Absolutely nothing changed. And so when people went to go and hand in guns, they did so making a fraction of what, what the market price of the gun was, Keep in mind, these people were paid out of taxpayer money to hand in their guns, but the criminals still held on to their guns. And this second amnesty that we're holding will implement the same system, uh, minus the shooting, and with the addition of criminals being all the wiser after the last gun gun amnesty. Of course, we have the Adler shotgun controversy, in which uh, it was perceived that a certain gun might be considered dangerous. Keep in, keep in mind that to uh, obtain that gun, you need a completely clean uh, mental health state assessment, completely clean uh, law record, with the exception of, I believe, very minor motor infringements, such as you know parking, uh, speed, and that sort of thing. Gun, gun owners are, in Australia at least, the most sane 
upstanding citizens across the continent. Uh, and that really, that really should be, you know, acknowledged when it is. Well, there's a whole uh, bunch of other topics uh, we could discuss, but unfortunately we're out of time. So thank you, David, for being a guest on today's show. Thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed it more than words could possibly express. Thank you, Tim. Oh, that's good to hear. We, we always li like to hear that our guests enjoyed uh, being on the show. And of course, I'd advise uh, all of our uh, listeners to go and check out David's articles at Being Libertarian. Uh, uh, go and join the Ancapistan group so you can enjoy his chip posting, sometimes multiple times per day. Uh, good luck for the future, and I'm sure we'll, we'll meet again in person soon and we can chat in person properly as well. I'd very much appreciate that. Thank you. All right, so the usual reminders apply at the end of the show. So if you haven't already, sign up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, please consider supporting the uh, work of The Unshackled. You can become a patron on Patreon, where we've organized some awesome rewards for, for people who support us. Uh, also, don't forget that there's Unshackled merchandise available at the uprightmarket.com. And of course, please check out our upcoming events at theunshackled.net slash events. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.